I'm David Tunick, president of the IFPDA, and I'm glad to welcome you all to the second day of print month and our IFPDA panel with four museum directors spanning eight time zones and three countries. These are four individuals who are, should be well known to you, each one a superstar in the art world and well beyond. It would take the rest of the week to enumerate their many degrees, honorary degrees, awards, publications, exhibitions, and other singular achievements. So the intros in alphabetical order will be short. But before we start, let me mention that we will try to get to all questions before this is over, but we probably cannot in the one short hour we have, and with some 500 plus people who have registered to attend. It's important that you send your questions via the Q&A bot button at the bottom of your screen. If you take your cursor down and hover over it, you can click on it, text in your questions. A few of you have already sent questions in via email. We have those. Um, and so let's get to it. And first, I'm going to introduce uh, Michael Govin. Michael, if you would uh, Say hello and uh, uh, hi, everyone. Everybody hi, David. Hello, Michael. Nice to see you again. Uh, Michael's from the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, where he is the CEO and Wallace Annenberg director. Uh, Michael worked with Tom Krenz as an undergraduate at Williams and then with Krenz at the Guggenheim, where he served as deputy director. He was deeply involved in the building of Bill Bow as well. He next ran the Dia Foundation in New York before taking over as director at LACMA in 2006. Next up, Glenn Lowry. Glenn, if you could uh, say hello so everybody can see who you are if they don't already know. Hello, everyone, and greetings, David. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, Glenn was appointed the David Rockefeller Director of the Museum of Modern Art here in New York in 1995, which in a few years will make him the longest serving director since the museum opened in 1929, and I believe Glenn is only the fifth or sixth director of MoMA. Prior to MoMA, Glenn was director at the Art Gallery of Ontario in Toronto, and prior to that worked as a curator in Asian art at the Smithsonian and the Freer. Sir Norman Rosenthal. Norman, I think we've seen you already, but please hello, say hello. How are you from London? I love Prince. That's what I want to say. As Sir Norman Rosenthal was knighted, was knighted by the Queen of England in 2007 for his service to the nation. He is the retired exhibition secretary of the Royal Academy in London, a position that in effect made him director. Prior to the Royal Academy, Sir Norman was a curator at the Institute of Contemporary Art in London. Sasha, my old friend Sasha Suda, please say hello. Hi, everyone. Hi, David. Hi, Sasha. Hey. Sasha was appointed director of the National Gallery of Canada in 2019. Prior to her engagement in Ottawa at the National Gallery, she was curator of European art at the Art Gallery of Ontario. One of my favorite exhibitions ever was one she curated called Small Wonders, Gothic Boxwood Miniatures, which traveled to three countries. I saw it at the Cloisters in New York. Full transparency for the five of us on this Zoom share and on the modern. We're dispensing with the usual individual statements and we'll dive right into it. And um, let's begin panelists by admitting that there are lots of commonly held misconceptions, misperceptions about prints. I mean, what do we say? What do you say when someone asks, why would anybody bother with prints? There are only multiples. I know that most of you in the audience are probably already part of the converted faithful but this is worth examining for a few minutes. And let's start with Glenn. Uh, Glenn, um, why do prints matter to you? Or, or maybe they don't. You, you trained in American art and segued over to Asian early in your career. What relevance do prints have to you and to MoMA? Huge relevance. First of all, the very first works of art that I collected uh, were prints. I got interested in the transmission of European modes of visual culture to Muslim India, to the Mughal court. And the means of that transmission was actually prints and printed books. And so immediately one begins to understand the portability 
of prints. They were a form of er early digital communication. They were readily available, reasonably uh, inexpensive, and capable of expressing the very same powerful ideas that other works of art have. And over the years, I've become increasingly interested in prints, in part because of their accessibility, the fact that they are a democratic mode of artistic production, but also because some of the most interesting artists in the world have turned to prints as a means of creating some of their finest works of art. And for those uh, who know the Museum of Modern Art well, one of the founding collections at the museum was Abby Aldrich Rockefeller's gift of almost 1600 uh, prints and works on paper. That is the, the kind of source material that so much of this institution grows from. And one of our most recent gifts um, was Merrill Berman's uh, group of Soviet and Eastern European prints, works that would be impossible to collect today uh, and that reflected his deep interest in the ways in which ideas were propagated and transmitted in the 1920s and 30s in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. And a quick story, because it's one that many on this call will know. Uh, Merrill wanted to collect Gustav Klimt and uh, Kirchner and the great paintings by German expressionists uh, and Viennese artists that he couldn't afford to collect. Uh, and rather than feeling sorry for himself, he asked a simple question. What is it that I can collect where I can find the best in the world, where I can be the most interesting and important collector in my field? And so he turned to an otherwise neglected area at the time, which were Eastern European works on paper and especially prints. In result, those now form a core collection at the Museum of Modern Art precisely because of their importance. And in fact, Glenn, uh, you are perhaps the first or one of the first institutions to integrate uh, with paintings the hanging of works of art on paper, which so many of us were very happy to see. How has that been received? I think it's been received very well. In fact, we returned to something that we did when we were founded in 1929 and 1930 in the early years of our existence, where the boundaries between media were not rigid. Uh, and then over the ensuing decades, they not only became rigid, they became impermeable. Uh, and so you had print galleries and drawing galleries and photography galleries and painting galleries. Uh, and we've come to the simple understanding that how we collect, which is by medium, is not necessarily how we display or should display our collections. And so the integration of prints and works on paper with all of the other media has created, I think, a much more vibrant experience at the museum. But even more importantly than that, it has allowed us to tell a much richer and more complex story because with prints, one can embrace a much broader spectrum of artists than one might be able to embrace only through painting or only through drawing or only through uh, photography for that matter. Right, Michael Govan, I think you're the first director at LACMA to attract the Hollywood set in any kind of numbers. There were a few collectors years ago like Edward G. Robinson, Kirk Douglas, but, but you apparently have many more than just a couple who've come to love the museum and who participate in your programs. Uh, do you want to deliver the bad news to us that none of them are involved <laughs> with prints? But before perhaps you do that, I'd like to point out how proud the IFPDA was to award our annual book prize uh, to your print curator, Noko Takahatki in 2019 for her wonderful publication on the Kioskuro Woodcut in Renaissance Italy. So Michael, over to you. Uh, yes, the Kioskuro Woodcut uh, print show was, I think, one of the most beautiful shows we've mounted at LACMA. I was, it was just utterly magical to, to get up close to those amazing prints. Uh, you obviously know the book well, but that's just one example, I think, of the um, sort of priority I've personally tried to place on prints. And uh, like Norman said, I love prints. <laughs> In fact, 
I guess my whole origins in museums begin with prints, very honestly. I, I, I drew a lot as a kid. I went to art school and actually when I was in Williams, I was studying fine arts and um, made prints and, and just absolutely fell in love with the tactile uh, quality of, of, of printmaking and, and understanding how each medium, whether it's intaglio or, or uh, silk screen or whatever it was, had a completely different quality, which is why you can do things in prints that you can't do in every in any other medium. That's very clear that there it's so specific each each kind of print and 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 that expands. And uh, <laughs> I think you helped me, David, with my very first exhibition as a young person, which is now thirty five years ago, when my first exhibition was uh, prints of. Picasso and Rembrandt and tying the iconography of Picasso's big Minotaur or Maquis print uh, to many of the works and his Vollard suite to, to, to Rembrandt's works. So therein, I guess, started the problem <laughs> of the obsession with uh, prints and printmaking in my own career that we've tried to, um, to put forward. In, in, at LACMA and Glenn, you're talking about across media and that's something we, we really care so much about is mixing things up in that way. There, there is no hierarchy because again, each medium has its own um, quality. And so when you see, if you see our permanent collection installations and what we're planning, it'll definitely be mixed up. And I totally resonate with the uh, collecting the best. We did an exhibition not too long ago of, uh, of a entirely from the collection of Jordan Schnitzer, who's a print collector in the United States who, who did the same thing. He wanted to collect the best and so he collected prints. We made this beautiful Ellsworth Kelly show and no one walked into the show and thought about anything except Ellsworth Kelly color, shape, form. Uh, it was immediately forgotten in a way, in a good way that it was, it was prints in that case. Um, and so uh, I, I think it's it's uh it's so beautiful that we can prioritize uh, prints and they have all those qualities the democracy of of art making and distribution uh, one of the things we've done also is we we love the idea of whole presses so recently we acquired uh, the jacob samuel press hamilton press and lapis press co uh, print collections with the grunwald center at the hammer and it's really nice when you have a large collection of prints and you can share them um, and, and those have actually brought us closer together as museums. Uh, so I, I, I could go on and on for hours about prints and probably we, we, we all will, but I, I start my thinking about art actually with printmaking. Well, thank you for mentioning- uh, Oh, George. Hollywood. <laughs> and by the way, we will get them. There are Hollywood. many Hollywood collectors. Actually, it was Vincent Price who, who was made the first effort to create a museum for Los Angeles. There are many collectors through Hollywood. We have many gifts. They're just a little bit uh, under the radar. And uh, that will be the next project, which is to make sure printmaking is a priority in Los Angeles throughout. And of course, Vincent Price had a, a gallery at, at, in Sears. Vincent Price, the, the movie actor, and did so Absolutely. much popularizing uh, prints in this country, what, in the 50s and uh, 60s. And I'm glad you mentioned Jordan Schnitzer, who's a great friend of the entire print world and of the IFPDA. And I'm also glad that you mentioned the Minotaur Machia print by Picasso, because I wish people could understand, um, or more people would understand that there couldn't have been a Guernica painting, uh, for example, without the uh, Minotaur Machia well, print. And by the way, if you look at his career, that print was made between paintings on both sides and not much was made. It is a statement for that artist, like for many artists that is, for, for that artist, the equivalent of any of the greatest paintings, absolutely right. and clearly. Right. Sasha, I recently had the, uh, that is early in the summer, I guess it was, the pleasure of attending an online opening. Uh, you were showing the Macon's uh, collection, Dr. Macon's uh, in Canada, who's a great friend of many of the people in the IFPDA. Uh, where, where do you think prints belong uh, in a museum and, and, and speak to anything else uh, you would like to while you have the floor, please. Well, I think, you know, I want to just um, kind of shore up some of what's been said in that prints are exciting and dynamic, you know, and, and that is a dynamic that is goes way back in time, you know, into the late 15th century with the emergence of this technology. And we, we rarely you know, here in our environment, people talking about printmaking as a technological wonder. And it's still where it lives in my imagination. I mean, there's a, an incredible urgency about the dissemination of ideas. 
and about, um, you know, connecting and communicating with humans beyond, you know, where you can see and with whom you can speak that it lives within prints. And so I'm thinking about a, a show at the Louvre on uh, 15th century printmaking from a few years back, which they weren't sophisticated prints, but holy smokes, I mean, the urgency to communicate critical ideas of belief systems and to articulate one's value set through through simple images. And the important thing being that you could do it more than one at a time and you could send them fast and far. Um, and that, you know, to me kind of pulled me into uh, the world of Durer, obviously, which um, is more about more than just communication, but about, you know, a medium serving an artist to build a brand and about storytelling and how one kind of dominates a field. And it's that that urgency to get those ideas out and not worrying about a hierarchy, but really thinking about an image and what it can do within society that sort of got me excited. And I say all of that um, with uh, full disclosure that I studied medieval manuscripts. So I think it was sort of I got it was so um, that that one unique thing that I got excited by Prince to launch me out of that world. And, you know, I think that prints in, in a museum obviously belong on the walls and everything that both Michael and Glenn have said of mixing media is critical. And so many museums are doing that well now. And I think all print curators want to do that and are excited to do that work and are doing it well. And I think we can't forget about the print study rooms. I think that's where really a lot of the magic happens. Um, that's where the urgency of the prints comes alive. That's where the imagination of our of our visitors comes to life because they get to see something that either a publisher or artist touched, retouched. Um, every every one is different from another. I mean, there's different states, but you know everything that's survived this far. It's amazing, portable, easy to damage that it has survived, and that magic comes to life in print rooms. And it's where I've built a lot of relationships myself, working uh, at the at the Clark uh, under Jim Gantz, great curator and a trainer of many, many, many good um, print specialists. And it's where the relationships of so many people in this, this room, this Zoom room, um, have come to life for me. So I think in this conversation, we also have to remember kind of not just that the, the needs that prints have, you know, to be rotated and to be stored in the dark are you know, labor, but they're actually opportunity to bring people together around art in a really physical way. So I think they belong there and they, they must be brought to life in those spaces. Thank you for that, Sasha. Sir Norman Rosenthal, um, you've often talked about how accessible prints are. Can you, can you uh, discuss that, why, why you do say that? And did that notion uh, play a role in the London Original Print Fair uh, taking place for the first time at the Royal Academy. Uh, Norman? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, Glenn took the word democracy in a way out of my mouth. I was going to sort of start by saying prints are somehow more democratic than works of, as it were, works of art. And in a funny way, the uniqueness of great works of art, of many of what people think of as great works of art, whether they're by Leonardo da Vinci or whether they're by Jasper Johns, a painting by Jasper Johns, is in a sense a disadvantage because it's, you know, you have to, it's only there in the one place where it is. And nobody says Beethoven is, uh, has to be only in one place or nobody says that Dickens can only be in one place. So, I mean, this idea of hierarchy in art in terms of media is absolutely absurd. And as I say, there's a kind of disadvantage. You know, it is as it is. You know, painters paint paintings and obviously they're unique and that is wonderful. And they've obviously for that reason, when they become successful, they become valuable, sometimes unspeakably, sometimes even they disgustingly valuable. So that is another issue one can discuss because prints of course are, can be Amazing prints can be relatively easy to access. You can see a print on a museum wall, and maybe you, you might feel, I'd like to have that at home. And if you're lucky, you might be able to have it at home. And this thing about art being a form of memory, a form of culture, and a form of also, you know, incredible pleasure is something that uh, 
one can experience in many ways, both privately at home and in public museums on the wall. And for example, last week, I went to the Ashmolean Museum where there's this fantastic ex exhibition about the Edo period, but not just the Edo period, as it were from the, from the 16th Japanese Edo period from you know the founding of Tokyo. Basically, it's about Tokyo right up to the present day. And you know, not only is there Hiroshige, but they're also amazing Night, late 19th, early 20th, and mid 20th century printmakers. And you know, what they do is absolutely extraordinary. And they really do reflect, like all works of art, time, zeitgeist, all those things. You know, they are very multi layered. And you know, the multi layeredness of a work of art is part of its extraordinary beauty. Let me put this out to uh, all of you and feel free to just uh, speak up. Do you think the attitude toward Prince has changed in your time in being involved as curators and museum directors? Um, and secondly, uh, what about the typical, is there such a thing as a typical print collector? How do you characterize uh, a print collector. Um, Norman, you're, do you want to answer this first or perhaps somebody and else? Everybody, like every artist is an individual, every individual, every person, every collector is an individual, every human being is an individual. And you know, this love, I mean, you know, if you put aside, if if you have put aside a newspaper, and put it in the bottom of your drawer, the day Kennedy died or the day Lady Di died, you know, and you put this and maybe later on you frame, JFK or Lady Di or whoever it is, and the front page of it, in the sense you're a print collector too. So it exists on so many different levels. And I just see, you know, my daughter here, you, you have this uh, beautiful Baselitz here, you know, on a cup. It's a print as well. So, I mean, and Baselitz, of course, is a huge print collector. You know, the, 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 uh, the painter George Baselitz, he's one of the great collectors of chiaroscuro. A 16th, uh, a 16th and 17th century curiosity woodcuts. You know, it's an, an amazing collection of museum quality. You can build a museum co collection if you like as a print collector more easily than probably in any other department. And for example, in the 1920s, for example, English mezzotints fetched huge prices. Now you can go out and buy them for a hundred pounds, but it doesn't change their nature. They're just as beautiful and you can have an amazing souvenir of artists like Joshua Reynolds or Gainsborough or, uh, or, who, or, or, or whoever and uh, enjoy them in your own home, but also in museums. Yeah, going back to artists as uh, print collectors, Leo Costello used to come to us every year and, and buy a dur for Jasper Johns. And as many of my colleagues know, this goes on with contemporary artists today. Glenn, you have you want to jump in on this question at all about attitude toward prints and what print collectors are like? Sure, but I just want to say for the record, I could listen to Norman forever. Uh, you know, there's no one more enthusiastic uh, or knowledgeable about art and particularly about prints than Norman, and it's always a pleasure uh, to be with him. I, I, you know, my own feeling is that the issue of whether or not prints are as important as other works of art uh, is an old issue that's been put to bed. Uh, you know, anyone who works in a museum knows that prints are an integral part to, to, to the visual landscape and the visual culture we live in and are every bit as important as other works of art. So I, I don't spend a whole lot of time uh, worrying about where prints fit in some kind of hierarchy because they are central and integral to the way at least I understand uh, the art world. And I think that's certainly been true for the last 20 or 30 years, if it hasn't been true uh, for longer periods than that. And, and, I, and Norman is right. Every collector is different. Some people are obsessive about needing to have an example of everything. Uh, other people like to drill into one very finite area uh, and build on that. And other people have yet different different approaches. And the only thing that I see in common with um, great print collectors is passion. They're all 
passionately involved in what they do, and they become highly knowledgeable about their material. And that combination of passion, curiosity, and knowledge, to my mind, is what unites all great print collectors, even though some will go in one direction and others in a completely different one. Um, our NFTs, I'll, I'll put this out to anybody, our NFTs, yes, do you think they are. Them, <laughs> do you think of them <laughs> as multiple? It's on my list. <laughs> do you think of them as multiple? I wish I, I'm a bit of yeah. a dinosaur. I wish I knew what an NFT No, was. no, I think, I mean, to your point, David, I think some aspects of what we talk about in prints are the medium itself and what's possible with the medium. I mean, it was a, you know, when I looked at, when I was a young person, couldn't collect art of any kind, and I saw a first Warhol print for an amount of money that I could actually afford, and I thought, oh, it's as good as the painting for sure. Same technique, same color, same effect, just did amazing. You, Michael, and, Michael, I'm going to jump in for a second. Did you know at the time that the paintings were prints also? As yes, of course. That was this idea that I knew like I was getting the same Warhol, <laughs> the same <laughs> impulse. But so there's some things about prints that have to do with the medium itself. You know, an intaglio is like a piece of sculpture where you can literally feel the three-dimensional quality and how ink uh, connects with the paper. And, and then there are other aspects that we've been talking about, which is a lot about this notion of accessibility. I mean, in the 70s in American art, I think, especially you think of Rauschenberg, Gondola, everyone, Frankenthaler, the, the idea, there was this great idea of distributing art just broadly through prints. And that comes and goes in history. And I think this current, you know, obsession with NFTs or digital art, the definition of a print is always changing, right? And, and this idea even is a photograph now, which is digitally printed, a print or a photograph uh, is a digital work of art, like an NFT, which is, is a, is a, which can be unique or in multiple, which is has the same impulse of that accessibility. And so I think, you know, you have to separate the different aspects of what we love about prints. The accessibility definitely courses through uh, all these other media right now, digital photography, uh, NFTs, all of that, um, even if each single, and I would say even digital art has its own qualities. The idea that light is behind it often because it's on a screen is also magical. And so there's so many different aspects in the 15th century and 15th and early 16th century, Dürer and his contemporaries were selling their prints in marketplaces and people bought them as kind of souvenirs, if you like, of their art as amazing images. But of course, Dürer without printmaking, imagining Dürer without, as, without prints is also, is to have, it, if you like, a much lesser artist. It was yeah. incredibly Unless important to him. It was incredibly important to also Rembrandt equally. Rembrandt, Rembrandt's prints are astonishing, uh, and as are D uh, Goya prints, and it's not for nothing. These are prints that, are, of course, now are very, very sought after, but there's so many artists who make prints, you know, right through, both in all over Europe and then later, of course, in America as well. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I'm not sure I agree, Michael, that, that NFTs are, are, are a form of printmaking, because I think NFTs are really a form of monetizing an otherwise unlimited edition. Uh, and so you can say that that, that, that has an analogy with a uh, print process, but in effect, the print making uh, is what the digital realm already does, the infinite capacity to reproduce an image identically. All an NFT does is create the opportunity to monetize one or more of those by tagging it. So I, I, I think, you know, I'm not so sure that print making is the right uh, dialectic. With, with I'm in, I'm in the same camp. I mean, for me, what's exciting about print making is that continuity of the process. So, I'm, you know, the, is it paper? Ultimately, is it? It is could, it, it could be. By the way, it's the notion of an ed paper. Paper is somehow paper and the ability to reproduce things on paper, somehow. Uh, Sasha, back to you. You, you can, were saying something. Oh, I just think there's there's something to the continuity in printmaking, you know, that links the, you know, the last 500 plus years. And when you look at artists that are working in printmaking today, you know, who have this urgency to create something, to communicate something, and they go to, you know, centuries old process. What does that mean? You know, there's something that connects a voice from today to voices 
centuries old. And I think that's really, really interesting. So, you know, the, the crossover into the digital realm is, is harder for me on that front. And it is partly the paper. It is partly being able to touch something. Um, I don't want to fetishize the object. On the other hand, there's something really, you know, there, these are objects that, that, that are really, really, really compelling. Yeah, in certain major museums, um, particular aspects of, of prints or areas of prints are being moved into other departments. I'm thinking of one of the most major museums in America where the uh, Department of American Art, uh, which is mostly paintings and, and sculpture, has been given full control of the American print collection. Uh, how do you all feel about that does everything go into the print department or print and drawing department in your various museums that comes in as a print museums divide themselves up in different ways i mean the fact for example that the prints the as it were the national prints and drawing department is in the british museum and in the national gallery not in the national gallery is a kind of accident of history and uh things happen the way they happen. I think it's just fine. You know, the Met is what it is. The Museum of Modern Art is what it is. All museums find their way of structuring. It doesn't really matter, I don't think. Right. I think yeah. that the, the fact that collectors don't think that way is what makes them really special. I mean, that curiosity, um, often quietly collecting, um, bringing things together that have a beautiful through line and then they come to us and we start to categorize them and somehow, you know, then also try not to lose that magic. And, and I'm also a great believer being a little bit of a collector myself in finding, not looking for things, just coming across things in a very often a totally surprising way I could tell you in the stories. I mean, I wasn't looking for my George Bellows, which is behind me, which I bought from David Tunick, but I walked into his shop, I saw it on the wall, not quite as cheaply, he tells me, but uh, as I seem to remember, but nonetheless pretty cheaply compared to anything else in his room. And as I say, this print, have you got it? You can show it, can you? This print, can you sh uh, turn it up? Are you able to Shari, show can you put it on Shari, can you put it on the screen? You know, the, the Southern Preacher. You could write a book about this print. It's one of 50, not signed by him, it's signed by his wife because he left the edition after he died. So it's a late print. But, and you know, it's all about Southern slavery. Uh, it's the most incredible thing. It's as great as any Goya. It's an amazing lithograph in an edition of about 50. I think in an edition of about 50, in addition of 50. And, you know, it's sad, beautiful, grand. And I, you know, when I saw it at a price I could afford, I mean, I walked into David for whatever reason, I can't remember, and I didn't expect to come away with it, but there it was, I could afford it compared to his incredibly expensive whistlers or whatever it is he generally sells. And it's not a nice subject, obviously, but it's a, God for sure, it's a powerful subject. And as I say, you could write a book about this print. I'm very proud to be the owner of this print. And one day it'll go to a museum. Uh, it's, uh, oh, Norman, I think what's, what? what's kind of fantastic about prints too is being demonstrated in this conversation is that uh, so many of us as whatever, curators, directors are print collectors. It's what we can afford. So there's a wonderful, quality of us being the collector, I think, sometimes when it comes to prints. You know, that that print, I'm going to jump ahead to a question that has come in in the Q&A uh, from someone who prefers to remain anonymous. In fact, I don't know who it is who sent the question in. But that person says, in today's cultural environment, how does diversity, is diversity taken into consideration when selecting works for your museums. Also, does the fact that the panel lack of diversity represent who is still control in the museum field? Well, Michael, you're on the screen. Do you want to deal with that? Uh, well, I think, I mean, diversity is the, is, is the uh, spice of our life. It's what makes our museums go, which is that the broader the representation of people and artworks, the more exciting um, 
we become to our audiences, many of them. And so, yes, it is an extremely high priority, I think, among a lot of us working and has been for a long time. So, yes, we do keep track of what we're buying, by which artist, depicting <laughs> who is who are these prints depicting if they're figurative and portraits. We have a huge show coming up of Black American portraits. Um, and uh, yes, it, for our curators, it's 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 what drives them right for a long time. I think to have the broadest, most diverse collections, uh, prints are part of that. Uh, it's a non. It's this drive also to have a non hierarchy, not just in medium, but in in thinking about many cultures and and many communities. Uh, we are. Um, yeah, we're, we're not that diverse as this group that you selected because of <laughs> partly, I think, your friendships over time. That, uh, but I don't think that that's reflective of the people that are making the decisions. I can certainly say in my case that the people who are making the decisions on which prints we buy uh, are a very diverse group. Uh, Sasha, I know that at the National Gallery Canada, you have a focus, in fact, on Native Canadians. You want to talk about that for a moment? I was very uh, taken by the benediction, I believe it was, at the uh, opening of the Macon's uh, exhibition. Absolutely, yeah, I can. I can talk about that, and it's relevant for sure to the question that was posed. And it's, uh, you know, here in Canada at the National Gallery, we're really here to serve all of Canada from coast to coast to coast. And and the demographic of this country has just changed so wildly since the gallery was founded over 130 years ago. And one of the things that's really right now, um, a sort of mainstream societal um, just passion is learning the stories and acknowledging the history of colonialism on indigenous peoples um, on this territory. So, you know, at the National Gallery, we are, you know, a, Crown Corporation, which is a federal corporation that really serves society at large and is funded by Canadians. So there's a real um, interest and expectation that we amplify those stories and that we really, you know, bring those artistic traditions to life in our galleries and our collection. And it's something that the gallery has been doing for over two decades and um, perhaps more quietly than we are now. Uh, but our audiences are also a lot less quiet about the expectation that that be what they encounter when they walk through our doors and that we helped them to understand and have access to some of those stories and histories. So, you know, I will say as a kind of addendum to that, and it's, and it's an important one is that I think we've really um, believe that if we center indigenous ways of knowing and being, which really um, are grounded in the idea that interconnection is critical to all of life. You know, not just all people, but the earth, the sky, the, the water. We need one another to, to survive and to live. Then if we lean and support that way of being and knowing, then we will be much more inclusive as an institution. So interestingly, leading with that kind of idea of an Indigenous storytelling and um, interconnectiveness, we've been able to be much more inclusive as a collecting organization and as, as a staff as we look to kind of uh, diversify the team as well. So, you know, it's, it's the aim also to bring that Indigenous piece to life, but more importantly, to be a more inclusive and diverse institution. That the history of humanity, of course, is not an all beautiful story of repre perfect representation or perfect diversity, which has obviously become in very recent years, rightly and happily, a very, very big issue. But, you know, for, we cannot turn, you know, Beethoven into a woman however hard we try, and you know, the great composers of the, in the 19th century or the great artists of the Renaissance into women. There are a handful of women artists, of course, but they, you know, we know perfectly well, we can't rewrite history in terms of our wishes for the present. And that I think is one of the great issues that face museums, face print collectors, of course, inevitably, you know, that beautiful print that I just showed you, of course, if you like, demonstrates the problem in a fantastic way, in a very critical way. But when you're buying a Dura print, you cannot pretend that he's dealing with the issues of today. He's dealing, art deals with the time in which it was made, culture deals with the time in which it was made, 
a place in which it was made. There are moments in history where women were incredibly important, probably a long, long, long time ago in prehistoric times and so on and so forth. But I'm afraid, you know, you can't get away from the facts of history. And that I think is an issue that perhaps, I don't know whether we can discuss it now, but it needs to be discussed. Well, I would just you know, I would just jump in, Norman, that you know we're all we're all products of our time and place in our generation. But I, I think there are other ways of looking at uh, the production of visual culture over long periods of time that surface different voices, uh, whether they are women or uh, people of color or indigenous uh, people. and you know, there is an art history that that is very Eurocentric, that privileges certain artists that we've all come to know. And there are art histories still to be written that will surface many different players and very different voices. And I'll say something that's absolutely heretical, but I, I actually believe it. There's no Bible, there's no Moses from Tablet that says, Picasso, who was without a question one of the giants of the 20th century, will still be a giant in the 22nd or 23rd century because tastes change, other voices appear, we discover different things from the past. And that certainty that you are articulating is not a certainty that I believe in. Uh, and I think one of the things that is taking place, certainly in the American Museum today, is an expansion of fields of vision that bring in voices and people that might otherwise not have been seen 25, 50, or 100 years ago. And it's all to our good that those voices are coming in. Switching gears yes. for a moment. Thank you, uh, everybody, for- I'm not really talking about that. Prince here, but these are vital issues. <laughs> And it is, well, by the way, it is our job to rewrite history. We're supposed to keep writing history. That's in our job description <laughs> to do that, <laughs> which we love. We have fun doing it. Do you um, really want to throw out Goya? Do you really want to throw? No, we don't have to throw out. Oh, but do you, you want to throw? I mean, Sasha, what do you think? You want to throw these great, what we can, I mean, our generation, the generation on this Zoom, Elizabeth, I've got, that the, out. I've got the shredder expand. right next to you my. You want bed. to expand. You <laughs> want to expand, but you don't want to throw out, do you? No, I just. I my preferred method is shredding. What? <laughs> <laughs> of course not. I'm just teasing. But I mean, what I'm. I think prints sort of take care of this, bringing this full circle of kind of why are they special? They're also finite. They're not infinite, right? So with each um, image, you know, there's a new one all the time. And I actually think that it's our job to create that continuity. And I think that's what you're saying, um, Sir Norman, is that there's, it's our job to create that continuity and to, to bring those histories to life and each give us that opportunity. Print, each print is a little moment in history for many, many perspectives, you know, from the, from the, uh, from the perspective of the maker, from the specter, the person who, when it was made and so on and so forth. And we can't get rid of that. Well, I'm a medievalist, so you're preaching to the converted here. <laughs> so, change, cha changing the subject for a moment. Uh, here is a question that comes in from Lee Rosenbaum. What is your reaction to the Mets decision to sell a large trove of prints and photographs that it says are duplicates using the proceeds to alleviate financial shortfalls. Glenn? Oh, Lee knows my answer to that question. She's asked it many times. Um, so I, I will uh, leave it that in this past 24 months with the impact of the pandemic, uh, where institutions certainly throughout 20, the, the second part of 2020 and the early parts of 2021 saw their finances plummet. Uh, the relaxation of the AAMD's guidelines, Association of Art Museum Directors guidelines concerning deaccessioning was one of many tools that enable museums to weather the crisis that they have faced, at least in the United States, uh, 
with far less damage than might otherwise have occurred. Anyone else? Well, I just found, I, I'll just tell you, only th three or four weeks ago, I found in a sort of, I found online in a junk shop in Norwich, which is a small town in England, not far away from where I've been through the pandemic in the countryside, the most amazing print, deaccession from the Met in the 19... 70s by a guy I think called John McHenry. Do you remember him? Some of you may McHenry. He deaccessioned it then. And it has, you know, uh, it has all the right things on the back, you know, deaccessioned then. It was bought in 90, it was sold in 1917, bought from Colnagis, a well known print dealer, and obviously went to the Met and it obviously was a duplicate. And it probably came, as far as we can tell, from the Aaron Little collection, cost me 250 pounds. Let me just jump in for a second, Norman, because and I'm I just telling you, Norman, art is about rescuing things from ignorance. And, you know, things have a way of going through the world. And deaccessioning is what it is. And, uh, you know, I mean, nobody knows. You know, there's not a single person who's seen every object in the Metropolitan. Nobody's seen every object, the millions of objects in the in, in the in the in the uh, in the British Museum. I mean, art is a bottomless pit and uh, a bottomless pit of pleasure too, and a bottomless pit of knowledge. And these great museums, I suppose if they deaccession, it's a pity, but then things come round again. Yes, let me say this, that I worked under John McHenry in the print department at the Met in the uh, late 60s. And the, the policy, the protocol was very formal. Nothing could be deaccessioned unless it was a duplicate and inferior to an example they kept. It doesn't mean that mistakes have been made uh, various times, but um, they were always extremely judicious in what they chose to uh, deaccession. I suppose raising funds uh, for the physical plant is different than the rules were at least at that time. And I think that prevail in most museums that if an item is deaccessioned, the funds have to go into acquiring uh, more art. Uh, anybody else on that subject? If not, we'll move on to um, another question. Uh, here is somebody who says, uh, Robert Crisell, we are longtime art collectors, including paintings and limited edition prints. It disturbs us that G. Clay prints are now in vogue depicting some of our paintings and some of our signed prints. This seems to us to dilute the market for these objects. They're unquestionably created to monetize the art market. Um, so what is your opinion about this uh, medium? Uh, Michael, you know what G. Clay prints are? They're yes. widely can you speak Well, to I mean, I, I know I didn't do so well in my NFT example, but that is a way of additioning. So we have things that are unlimited and can be copied and copied depending on the medium. Some plates wear out, but uh, you know, I think that that you know we have additions. We have we can hold on to things that are very specific and prescribed that were done in, this, in in a particular time and place, and we have a way to keep track of that. The dissemination of images for the pleasure and knowledge of people, I think is an exciting thing. Um, and, you know, I, there's so many different, that's the thing, it is so dynamic. It's interesting that some of the rarest things that we have are also prints in the form of graphics and posters. Movie posters were made by the thousands to be put up, but of course they weren't saved. And so that Metropolis poster is absolutely unique and sort of more like a painting in a way. And I think, you know, over time, we have a big initiative to collect graphic design, which is less about, it's on paper, <laughs> unlike <laughs> the digital. Um, it has very specific qualities, depending on when those things were printed, at what time, posters, silk screens, they use many medium. And it's really, really exciting um, without this sort of question of an edition and without it being limited. Uh, so I just think there are different ways to look at things. And a market isn't necessarily diluted if there's you know, a, a specific edition of something that's rare. Well, Duras were often just pasted on people's walls. And the, the reason that a Dura is so rare is not many were not pasted on walls, for example. And in fact, a print room, originally I discovered for my wife, 
you know, there are rooms where prints were really in stately homes in England, where they were literally pasted onto the wall into, into a way, in a way that would be unthinkable. But uh, uh, a museum curator would never paste a print onto the museum wall, would he? Um, a Jay Mendez writes in a question about your museum's policies in mounting exhibitions that are prints only, shouldn't they be displayed to provide context? I think that Mr. or Ms. Mendez uh, probably missed, for example, um, the new installation at MoMA that we mentioned earlier, as well as uh, a great exhibition at the National Gallery, I don't know, five, seven years ago of Mary Cassatt in which our members, uh, Mark Rose and Susan Pinsky, IFPDA members, were the curators for the print side of that. And prints were shown in full integration with paintings and drawings. But uh, do any of you want to add to that as a response to uh, this question that came in about providing context? There is a comment. Go ahead. All works of art need context. You know, you can't understand any work of art unless you understand the context in which it was made and what it's about. It doesn't matter whether it's a painting or a print or a drawing or whatever it is, or even I dare say an NFT, if I, I'm not quite sure still what an NFT is, but I'm sure Michael will tell me one day. You'll but, be collecting uh, them soon, Norman, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying is context is everything. You can't understand any work of art without understanding its historical context, its art context, et cetera, et cetera. Here, here's one that comes back to uh, haunt us and has for many, many years, going back to the 50s and 60s, I can remember the Print Council of America trying to come up with a definition of what an original print is. This comes from Yasmin Canvin. Do any of the panel use a specific definition of how they might define what a print is. For example, the tape defines a print as an impression from one surface onto another. What are your uh, definitions? Uh, Glenn? That's not a bad definition. I mean, I think we've all come to accept that the more conventional notion of a print being uh, a transfer onto paper or another similar surface uh, has been exploded by artists, especially in the 20th century. So we now collect in our print um, department what many would call multiples. Uh, uh, Norman's mug uh, might be collected if it were uh, of sufficient interest. And, uh, you know, it, it, it is this notion of the trend, uh, a transfer must occur of some sort from one one surface to another. But the, the means by which- yeah. There you are. Uh, <laughs> but but I, the, you know, for me, the interesting thing is, uh, and, and Sasha touched on it, what makes print, print so interesting is that they're a process, that, that a mechanical process takes That's place. Uh, and, and there are many different ways of affecting that transfer, whether through a mold, through uh, pressure, uh, through uh, photographic reproduction, but that prints themselves are the reflection of that process of transferal. And I think the, the, the Tate's definition is pretty good. You know, we had Jeff Koons as a speaker at um, a print, an IFPDA print fair at the Javits a couple of years ago. And um, as you may know, uh, with uh, his large and most recent prints, um, he doesn't really put a hand to them and they're sold for a fair amount of, of money. And we asked him, what makes that an original print if you've never touched a, a plate, a block, stone, et cetera? And he said, all he did was point at his head. And the answer was he had conceived of it. So are we at a point where an original print is whatever an artist calls it, whatever he or she conceives it, Glenn. Well, I mean, that's that, that issue of conceptual art has been around for 50 years now. Uh, you, know, what, you know, what is a Saul Lewitt wall drawing? Uh, 
it, it's a set of instructions. Um, what is a tight? Uh, what is a tight Carl Andre uh, sheet of paper? Yeah. Which would now so, go for a lot of money. Uh, you know, I, I think all art is ultimately about ideas, right? That's where they start, right here. That's where art starts, right up in that little part of our body. Uh, and the way in which it is realized is, uh, is open to any number of different means. Uh, you know, you, you, you go back to the, to the Renaissance and an artist's studio. Uh, how many paintings were actually painted by the hand of the artist alone? So, you know, Jeff just takes that to another, uh, to an extreme level. But if you don't, you know, you go to Jeff's studio, he fusses over every detail. These are not just sort of from his brain to the end result. He I is obsessed about each color, each line, each detail. I it's just that he doesn't have to do it himself. It's scary, his attention to detail. Yes, in fact, he stopped by our booth uh, that year um, with his publisher and, and uh, he said, they said that he had rejected something like 50 different silver materials for the round ball that was going into the middle of what I thought were uh, reproductions of old master paintings. Uh, anybody else to add to this discussion? Sasha, Michael? Okay. question. Well, I think it's dynamic all... and elastic. Sorry, Michael. It's you... dynamic and elastic. There's printmaking has a, it definitely has a soul. There's this sense of that initial impulse, which starts in more primitive technologies. And I think even when we're having those discussions or talking about postcards or NFTs, we are still in this zone about thinking about this magical thing, which is making um, impressions of things. Uh, sometimes limited, sometimes not, but that that technology, which is different from just the handwork is something I think that we still just, it goes in different directions. It's dynamic. Before we let exciting. you go, can you identify the image behind you as other than them? <laughs> so, <laughs> it's a work on paper. This is very large, actually. It's a work we own in the collection. I think it's about eight feet tall. It's by Vera Luter, the artist. Actually, her work was on the front page, front of the New York Times Magazine. And this is a pinhole camera image. So it's a, I guess it's a print made by the sun uh, and light onto paper. And it's actually unique. It's the temple in Pestum. Uh, and it's, uh, it was quite a trick. Her, her camera, if you will, pinhole camera is the size of a large container to make these huge images. And then interestingly, she doesn't reprint them. This is a negative, so it's in its original form. This could be used, of course, to make a print. It looks wonderful. And I thank all of you. You are all extremely busy people. Not one of you said maybe or perhaps. You all came back very quickly when uh, we invited you to this panel and you said, yes, of course. So uh, Sir Norman, thank you. Glenn, great. Sasha, uh, Michael, uh, wonderful. I just want to say before we sign off here on time that there is a uh, discussion every day, a Zoom discussion during this uh, print month, which goes on actually for about three weeks. And tomorrow it will be uh, a print study day in the department at the Metropolitan Museum. Uh, lastly, I'm gonna ask our staff who are in the background and heroically have provided all the technology here, Jenny Gibbs and uh, Shari Young, to see if they can capture the questions in the Q&A that we did not have time to get to and we shall uh, dispense them and ask all of you on the panel to take another few minutes of your valuable time uh, to perhaps uh, get back to us and we will pass on the, uh, your responses to these excellent questions. And we thank all of you who did send and those in. We Sorry. should thank you, we need to thank you, David, because you have been an inspiration very personally to so many of us in your passion for Prince and your knowledge, which you have often shared and your encouragement. So thank you for that, not just this panel. Yeah, yeah. Very, very generous. Lovely to see you all from the of all of you. I, Atlantic. I, I look forward to crossing the Atlantic soon. We look forward to seeing you, Norman. Great to see everybody. Yeah. Can't wait. Okay.
Thanks, David, for bringing us Thanks together. Okay, bye, everybody. Thanks bye. very much. Thank you. Bye.